Thank you very much. Um, we'll go ahead and get started here. I did throw some slides together with David's help. Hopefully you see them all and I can figure out how to advance. Um, we've been introduced to you, but let me quickly introduce myself and then let David introduce himself. My name is Andrew Ellis. I'm the Associate Director of Research Compliance at Loyola. So as part of that position, supporting the IRB and making sure our researchers are following the regulatory and university requirements is a part of that job. I've been doing it now since 2009 at Loyola and at a different university, I had a similar position before this. Um, and I'm always available. So if you have questions, concerns, want help with that IRB stuff that we talk about today or in the future, you can always reach out to me. David, do you wanna go ahead and, and introduce yourself? Sure, uh, I'm David Ensminger. I'm actually a faculty member in the School of Education. Uh, I'm an associate professor. Uh, and I teach in our teaching and learning group and also in our research methods group. Um, I'm a vice chair. I'm one of the of two vice chairs on the IRB uh, committee. Uh, I've been on the IRB committee for, I think, about four years now. Uh, and I'm also one of the contacts that you can have if you've got questions regarding IRB applications and processes. Andy, are you frozen? Uh, Do we lose them here? Oh, okay. Hopefully he'll be back here shortly. That answers that. <laughs> <laughs> Presentations in the modern era now. <laughs> I feel like the Zoom struggles are just so real. Yeah, they are. <laughs> I thought it was my computer because nobody moved for a couple of minutes there and I thought, hmm. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Oh, now you're on mute now. I'm back. One of the downsides of uh, remote work, right? Uh, let me go ahead and, and get, get going again here. Um, so now that I know that you're all planning to work with the IRB, has anyone gone through the IRB process at Loyola already? I've done it once, but I was guided with, by a faculty member. I've never done it like by myself. Okay. Yeah, so if you wanna share any of your experience while we're going through these things or, or suggestions, feel free to jump in. But it's good to know who's already experienced the process and, and that everyone else is pretty much brand new to the IRB at Loyola. This is quickly what we're gonna go through today. It's really a high level overview. We don't have time to really go into everything in detail, but as you can see in the title of my slide, I want this to be a discussion. So if there's something that comes up you'd like to talk about or question or, or throw in your ideas, that'd be great. Feel free to, to jump in. But we'll cover a little bit of the IRB background, its purpose and function, some of the requirements, and go through the process, what our student researchers are expected to do as far as the IRB process goes, talk a little bit about timeline, and then David's gonna go over um, some of the resources that are available to people with examples, common issues that you want to look out for, and then things to keep in mind and some other suggestions um, as you're going through your dissertation process, practice. So what is our IRB? First of all, if you didn't know, it stands for Institutional Review Board. It's a, an abbreviation that we hear uh, used incorrectly a lot, but I want to make sure everyone knows that's what it means. And it's a group of people here at Loyola that are dedicated to making sure all of our research is carried out appropriately, especially when we're involving other human subjects. Um, but it's, it's got a lot of moving parts. First of all, it's responsible for making sure that the research that's proposed at, at the onset is appropriate, meeting the regulatory requirements and our Loyola policies, but it doesn't end there. The, the IRB is also responsible for monitoring the studies as they take place so that anything that pops up or unexpected situations get handled, um, especially if there's a problem with participants. That's what our IRB is here for. Researchers can come to the IRB and say, this happened, what do I do? How do we adjust the study to prevent it in the future if it's a problem and that type of thing. It's just one component of, of protecting human subjects though. The IRB is here, but we also need our entire research community doing its part to make sure any problems or 
or unjust things with research are, are dealt with and reported to the proper place. So who is on our IRB? Now, if you see my slides, sometimes you'll see these numbers at the top. This is a reference to an actual regulation. So this comes from the federal regulations. Um, the IRB has to have at least five people. It can't just be one person like myself sitting here saying, yes, this project's fine or no, we need, we need to do something differently. It has, has to be a group. So we have input from a number of people on every proposal. Uh, you have to have sufficient qualifications of the people. And I quote this because I really like the way they worded it in, in our regulations. Um, the IRB has to be sufficiently qualified through experience and expertise to promote respect for its advice and counseling safeguarding of subjects. So these, the IRB members are people who have to, to understand the research that's being pr proposed as well as the potential risks. And then they have to respond to the research community in a way that promotes respect for its advice. And um, I've never seen our IRB come down and say, no, don't do this. No, you can't do this. This is inappropriate. When our IRB gives feedback, they do it in a very respectful way and they provide justification for anything that they're asking. So it's very different from other types of oversight committees in my opinion. It's a very collegial and respectful process where the researchers and the IRB should be working together to make sure that the research is done properly. Um, next, the regulations tell us that we have to have diverse membership. Um, we, we have a very diverse group of experts on our panel. Our board has currently 19 members and they pretty much represent all um, disciplines across our, our campuses, um, as well as community members. So we have to have a member that's not otherwise affiliated. We have two right now, people that have no relationship with Loyola and they look at the proposals from that viewpoint. Uh, we have to have someone with scientific concerns. Obviously the board has to understand the risks and benefits. And we have to have people with non-scientific concerns. And these are people that look at the proposals from the, the side of things that are, hey, if this, if this was my uh, family member in the study, you know, how would I feel about them being a participant knowing what I know about the research? So that's, that's what the makeup of our IRB is. Why do we have the IRB? Well, unfortunately, these are just some of the, the historical human subjects, um, projects that have taken place. And you can see, um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with them. We have kind of a bad history as people for using subjects inappropriately um, in research. So now uh, we created the oversight process. In 1981, the common rule took effect. And that's what gives the IRB its power and makes it a requirement for any human subjects researchers that get uh, federal government research support money, like Loyola. Regulation-wise, these are the main ones. We've got the common rule that I mentioned that took effect in 1981, and it's been followed up and changed. Um, in 2018, they published what became the final rule. It's an updated version of the common rule, and that's what we're following now. We've got Food and Drug Administration requirements for research that uses um, medical devices and, and pharmaceuticals. We've got the Belmont Report, which is um, the basic ethical expectations for researchers. It's used universally around the world for anyone that wants to involve live subjects. And we've got privacy rules, such as HIPAA, that govern medical information about people. So these are just some of the regulations they, that the IRB is making sure our researchers are following up with. Um, so what goes through the IRB? And that's human subjects research. So we, we need to be able to define what a human subject is. This is how it's defined in the final rule. It means a living individual about whom an investigator conducting research obtains data through interventor, intervention or interaction or identifiable private information. So the first part, if you're interacting with someone, that's usually pretty clear. Sometimes we're, we're not sure when we're accessing identifiable private information. Yeah, Colleen, you have a question? Yeah, sorry, on your previous slide, you talked about yep. um, the regulations. Mm -hmm. um, is FERPA also part of this conversation too? Because you it's, mentioned HIPAA, yeah. but I wanted to ask. 
Absolutely. So if you're if you're using students in your research, you want to make sure that FERPA is something you're compliant with. At Loyola, FERPA is handled by a different group because it's a universal. Um, it's it's bigger than research at Loyola because we're a, an academic institution. We have students and, and educational practices. So there's a different group that manages that. Um, but yes, absolutely. As researchers, we want to be conscious of any regulations that impact our population and, and our work. So thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Yep. Um, any questions about what constitutes a human subjects, human subject before we move on to the next definition? All right. The next one we need to define, and this is from the regulations as well as research. Um, only human subjects research is subject to IRB compliance. So research is a systematic investigation, including development, testing, and evaluation designed to contribute to generalizable knowledge. Activities that meet the definition constitute research for purpose of the policy, whether or not they're conducted or supported under a program for which um, is considered research for other purposes. For example, some demonstration and service programs may include research activities. When we're looking at how we classify research, it can be a very gray area. So if there's ever a question, oh, is this project something that, that's research and should go to the IRB? It's best to consult others and get other people's opinions so that we can make sure anything that could be subject to the IRB goes through the proper IRB oversight process. Um, as, a, as a research institution like Loyola is, we almost always consider our work to be classified as research if there's any question about it. So when do you need to get IRB approval? Department of Health and Human Services regulations tell, tell us that you have to have IRB approval prior to conducting any research with human subjects. FDA says you have to use it prior to using or conducting a clinical investigation. And our Loyola policy kind of combines the two. Um, I know your school of education researchers, you might not be aware of this, but we do have a substantial amount of medical-based research that's done through our nursing and medical schools. So that's why I include the FDA regulations in our, our talk. Um, our Loyola policy says we have to have uh, IRB approval prior to engaging in human subjects research. And within that, our policy includes a confirmation of exemption process. We'll talk a little bit more about what exempt research is in the, the talk in a few minutes. Um, Speaking of exemption, there are different levels of IRB review that are used for different types of projects. I'm gonna go over them quickly here. We've got convened review. This is also known as full review. This is when the IRB has to meet its quorum requirement. They will sit down and they will discuss the proposed research and determine their findings by a vote, voting to approve the proposal or voting to disapprove or require modifications. Those convened reviews happen once a month at Loyal. We have expedited review. Expedited review is for human subjects research that's minimal risk. And then all the activity of that project with subjects has to fall into certain categories that are in the regulations. And we have exempt review. Exempt review is human subjects research that falls into these now expanded categories of exemption. Um, and that can be reported to our IRB once. And if the IRB agrees that that meets the, the, the project falls into the exempt uh, category, it doesn't have to come back to us unless you make changes to the pr procedures or when the project's completed to close. That's different from the, the other categories that require IRB ongoing review, which are um, either annually or every two years for some of the expedited projects. Any questions about the different types of review? Because as a researcher, when you apply to the IRB, you have to, to tell the IRB when you submit which type of review you, you're requesting. Okay, so determining that, you first have to determine the risk classification of your proposed work. Is it minimal risk or greater than minimal risk? Minimal risk is defined in the regulations and that's essentially the, the normal risk people have throughout their daily lives or routine psychological and physical examinations. If it doesn't meet your daily risk classification, it's a greater than minimal risk project. All greater than minimal risk research has to go through convened IRB review. So when you're thinking about which uh, type of application to make, 
use the regulatory guidance and our policies, which are online. And there are um, flow charts. OHRP, the federal agency that gives us the guidance, they have flow charts that are very helpful in determining if your project would qualify for an exemption or expedited review. And then you can always contact me. And if it's something I'm not sure about, I consult members of the IRB and we help you decide which type of review you'll need. Um, this slide used to be one page. Um, before 2018, we had um, enough space on one slide for all the exemptions. In 2018, they expanded that and you can see it fills up, it's very wordy, but there are a lot of categories of exemption. We don't have time to go through all of them in one hour, but if you get a chance, you'll wanna take a look at the exempt um, categories. Um, and, and if you have questions about them, go ahead and let me know. But a lot of our research, actually the majority of our human subjects research qualifies for exemption. Loyola's policy, however, is a little bit more strict than um, what's permitted by the regulations. So if you're using pregnant women or uh, in virtual fertilization in your project, which we don't see much of, by the way, it, it can't be exempt. Um, if you're doing survey or interview techniques with minors, that's the survey or interview category. You cannot be exempt, um, but there's an educational activity uh, category that, that does apply with minors. Research involving public behavior with minors, if the, the researcher is interacting with them, uh, reviewing private health records or archival information, if it's identifiable and you can link it back to the subjects. If you're using any deception um, or participants are exposed to greater than minimal risk. Essentially, anytime there's more than minimal risk, it's gonna be convened. The common rule requirements, these again are right out of the regulations. So in order for the IRB to approve your work, they have to be able to show these seven things. First of all, that the risks to subjects are minimized. Second, that those risks are reasonable in relation to anticipated benefits. Third, subject selection is equitable. Fourth, informed consent is sought. And fifth, completely separate from the consent process that consent's documented appropriately. Sixth, there are provisions for monitoring the data as it's collected. And seventh, um, when appropriate, we protect the confidentiality and privacy of subjects. Those are, in, in an overview, the basic requirements. Now, if we had more time, we could go into each one, um, but does anyone have questions about any of these, what we call the 111 requirements? I did have one question and I don't know if you'll get to this, but I'm thinking out loud, should faculty and staff that are within departments be reaching out to IRB approval before doing surveys before um, to make like programmatic changes? Or is it only if you're publishing? It depends on the type of survey. If the survey is done for research purposes or you expect to use any of the information obtained from those surveys down the line for research, then yeah, you'll want to go through the IRB process before you administer the survey. Once the survey is done, there's no going back. You can never get um, retrospective IRB approval for activity. So once the survey is done and you don't have IRB approval, human subjects data cannot then be used for, for research. But um, yeah, if it's a quality improvement or some other type of survey, then there's no IRB requirement. And it doesn't hurt to apply for the IRB exemption for surveys. That way you've got it. If you ever do publish the data or disseminate it in another format, you can share it outside of Loyola that way. Uh, most surveys are gonna be exempt. Any other questions about these seven IRB requirements? Okay, let's go ahead and move on to a little game that I call regulated or not. So we're gonna have a few examples here. I think I included five in today's talk and we're gonna decide if it's something we need to report to our IRB before we do it. So first of all, we have an instructor evaluating classroom teachers techniques or activities and they wanna take those and publish the findings. 
who thinks we're gonna gonna have this go through the IRB or who thinks we're not going through the IRB? Now, can you guys raise your hands? Anyone feel that this is an, an IRB regulated activity? I do. Okay. I see I see some hands raised. That's correct. Okay. This would definitely be because um, we're when we're in the classroom, and, and David, if 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 you have more to add, feel free to jump in here. But if you when you're in the classroom, that's a, a private area. Um, in the United States, we, we consider classrooms to be um, not generally open to the public. So there's an expectation of privacy there. And um, so that's ac actually getting private and identifiable information of those teachers. And we want to publish the outcome. We want to draw a generalizable conclusion. So this one, I would say, has to get reported to the IRB. And it's probably going to be, be an exemption. I, I would add to that. Sometimes we, we don't think about schools as being workplaces, but the, the, the teacher is an employee of the school. And if you're engaging in any type of activity where you're critiquing their work and then making that public, it places their occupation at risk mm -hmm. or their, their employment level at risk, mm -hmm. if it can be identified back to them. Mm -hmm. All right, let's take a look at the next one here. This time we're looking at existing archival and some prospectively collected records. Um, we don't get any identifying information on the subject um, and we're not interacting with them. For example, we're just looking at charts that we have or databases. How do we feel about this one? I'm gonna say no. No? Most of the time you're, you're gonna be right. This is not human subjects, but it's gonna depend on what records we're getting. If we are, let's say we're a, um, a state's attorney and we're using criminal records that would not be publicly available and they include personally identifiable information. That's a human subjects activity. All right, so we have to look at what type of records or what type of archival data we're getting. Now, if it's something that we can go get at a public source or off the internet, then it's probably not human subjects and we won't submit anything to the IRB. All right, the next one, um, we're working with a historian who's doing oral histories and recording Vietnam veterans experiences with war and their PTSD. And then we're gonna take all the, the data from these interviews and publish it um, in a psychology journal. How do, we, how do we feel about this one? Something that's subject to IRB oversight or not a human subjects project? All right, we got a hand raised. Does anybody have a comment? Or are we just raising to show that this is, yes, something that's human subjects and needs IRB approval? Yep, this one is a, a clear example of something that we would have to, to submit a protocol to and get approved. All right, the next one we're doing surveys. And these are our surveys here at Loyola, um, let's say for example. Um, and we wanna just see if the university services are adequate for our personnel, um, students, et cetera. We don't, we don't really need to, to do anything outside of Loyola with our findings. It's just to improve Loyola services. How do we feel about this one? Something that we would want to submit to the IRB, maybe for an exemption? Anyone? No, so th this one, probably not human subjects research, and we don't need to go through the IRB process at all. So these are things um, my department won't even know about taking place. All right, because we're already at our halfway point, I'm gonna skip the next example and talk a little bit about the IRB process and requirements for our students at Loyola. The first and most, um, the biggest requirement that I wanna bring up right now for the students is that anyone doing human subjects research at Loyola 
and this includes even if you're going to apply for an exemption, has to do a basic training program. It's called CITI, C-I-T-I. Um, on the slide, you can see this is the, the Loyola policy, but it's an online co course that you sign up for. Um, and uh, I got the instructions on the next slide and it's required for anyone. So if you're gonna do human subjects, secondary data even, all, all personnel with human subjects at Loyola have to do the training. It's pretty straightforward. You'll go to cityprogram.org and we have a link on there for, for Loyola users. So there's a single sign on, they call it, which means you can go to that link and sign on using your Loyola username and password. And then it's gonna walk you through some setup questions. Because in addition to the human subjects training, City offers training for conflict of interest, um, live animal researchers, uh, a bunch of different programs. For the IRB, there's a course called Group One Lakeside Investigator, which is human subjects training that you'll need to take. Um, you go through each module and you complete the required readings and then you take quizzes. As long as you get 80% uh, on all the quizzes, the certification comes through to us. It takes about three to five days to show up at Loyola. And um, the important thing is if you're gonna be, be at Loyola for more than three years, you'll have to renew it. The certification is only good for three years. If you have any issues, I'm the, the city administrator at Loyola, so I can help you with that. Basically, the only thing I cannot do is look up your, your password that you have to go through ITS for. All right, any questions about online training for the IRB? Okay. Uh, then the next requirement um, that a lot of people have questions about as students, and this is the, the requirement of a faculty sponsor. So in order to be a student PI, you have to have a member of Loyola's faculty support your research. And in fact, that faculty sponsor is ultimately responsible for that, to the IRB for the conduct of the project. So you need to find someone, and I don't think students have trouble doing this, but if you do, um, you can work with your GPD or, or an advisor to help you find someone that will be able to supervise and oversee the human subjects work that you're doing. Um, it doesn't have to be the person that's in your dissertation committee, but the, P, the person that is your faculty sponsor does have to be current with their city training as well. All right, I sometimes get questions about that. And if you have more questions, you can always reach out to me. If the, the project you're doing is a requirement of your degree, so that's a master's thesis or a dissertation, that has to first be approved by your committee. And this has been in a transition for the last couple of years, but now this is all done for the most part through an online system called the Graduate School Proposal System, I think, GSPS. So your committee members and your GPD, they enter their pro pro approval in this system and it automatically sends a, a note to our office, which we put in the IRB file. Now, if you started your process already, there is a proposal ballot system that's been used in the past. Some students are still using that proposal ballot. And if that's your situation, you can upload it in our online system. Um, we got a chat. Okay, let's see. Um, do, does anybody have questions about the city stuff? I see there were some comments back I just noticed. Okay, we'll go, go ahead and speak up if, if there's questions and I don't see the chat, sorry about that. Um, and it is a little bit of a, a go around with the graduate school because the way that the process works and at least the way I understand it is your dissertation committee has to enter their approval but you still can't start the project. You have to then, if you're using human subjects, come to our office, get IRB approval. And then once the IRB approval is entered into our system, the graduate school approves you to start your, your thesis or dissertation. Um, so that's, that's how they work there. If there's a problem or for some reason you think your IRB approved and the grad school doesn't get that, let me know and we'll work directly with them. We have a, a graduate school representative on the IRB. So um, the application process, it's all done through an online portal. It's called CAP, Compliance Approval Portal. You can access the website from a link on the IRB site, or you can go to cap.luc.edu, 
and this system's available anytime. So if you're one of those people that works all night on stuff and you want to do it in the middle of the night, you should be able to. As long as you can get a secure connection to the internet, you can, you can access the system. We haven't had any problems lately, but when it first came out, um, HTTPS did cause a problem on Wi-Fi for some people, but you shouldn't have any issues. Andy? Yes. I was thinking for um, the CAP system and for um, the city system, I think you have to install the Global Protect on your device in order for you to get access. Is that correct? That is not. No. Okay. So both the cityprogram.org website and the CAP program should be accessible anywhere. Okay. You okay. do have to have a strong enough network to get what we call the secure, the secure connection. So if you're on a mobile device and the Wi-Fi is coming in and out, it, it will cause problems with the CAP system okay. because of its security. Once that connection is interrupted, it logs you out and nothing gets saved. You can't, you can't access any more data. But right now, there's, there is no global connect or um, secondary login um, mechanism. It's, it's just go to the website, log in with your Loyola credentials. All right. Um, next up, so the first time, if you've not logged in, um, the first time you log in, you'll use your Loyola ID and password, just like you do for everything else at Loyola. Um, if it doesn't let you get in there, then that means that we don't have a city record for you. It'll tell you to contact ORS, just reach out to me. Sometimes when our city records come in, they don't match up with the user accounts. And if that happens, I can fix it pretty quickly. Um, double check your profile, make sure that it's in there correctly. Um, we pull in department and status information. You know, if you're an undergraduate student or grad student or have another position, it should show up there automatically from the Loyola directory. But we do have a, often um, misinformation in there. So we, we can fix that too. Just let me know if you see something that needs to be changed. Um, you can contact me or Pavel. Pavel is our department database manager. He is the technology expert for research services and helps troubleshoot any glitches we have. Definitely not my expertise. Um, once you're in the system, you have to create a project. And the, the project is a placeholder for each individual project um, in the IRB system. So there's a button, start a new project. You click it, you fill out basic information here the title of your project, um, if you're a student PI, who's going to be the faculty sponsor, and then a couple of sentences, a, a summary about what the project's about. We don't need the full details. You just give us a quick summary so anyone that looks at that page will say, oh, I know, know what, what, what this project is doing. Um, and now you've created it. So there's a placeholder in the online system for the project, but there's no IRB information. Nothing comes to the IRB at this time. You will have to say if you're using human subjects or not, but you won't be submitting anything. That comes in step three, where you create the application. So once you've got your project set up, you click create an application. It walks you through 10 pages and it's a smart form. So it does adjust the questions as you answer them. Um, for example, if you're not using children, it's not going to ask you any for justification for using children. If you say I'm using children, it'll ask you follow-up questions. Or if you're giving out compensation, they'll say yes, and then it'll ask you, how's that compensation? What, you know, provided? What's the amount, et cetera? Um, so it does, it does adjust like that. That way, that, that, so keep in mind, if you make changes to answers, you might have new questions added. So you'll still want to click through the whole form to make sure you fill everything out. Um, that's, that's pretty good online once you get through it. Then the final step as a student is you have to have your faculty sponsor review it and submit it. Um, the system and the IRB will not accept submissions directly from students, so only the faculty sponsor can submit it. Uh, there is an option to request that in CAP. Don't rely on it though. If you click the request button, um, your sponsor gets an automated email that says, you know, Mr. Ellis has, has asked you to review and submit application 10. I might look at that at junk mail if I got it. So as junk mail, so follow up with your sponsor. All right. Make sure that, that they're on top of these because we, we've had in the past where students fill out the form and it sits there for weeks because the sponsor doesn't know it's waiting for them to submit. Once they do submit it for you, 
you get an automated email from our department that says we've received it and we're going to start processing it. All right. And then you can watch the status of it in the online CAP system. Once we have finished processing it, you'll get feedback. And some of the possible feedback you'll get is that we need additional modifications. If you get that, the more quickly you work on those modifications and resubmit, the more quickly we can get it reviewed again. Um, and you do all this right through the online CAP system. So you'll revise and update, and then you'll add comments back to the comments that we gave you. Yeah, I took care of it, or no, this is what I'm thinking. You can put back any feedback you want and resubmit. Just like when the original submission came in, though, it has to be your sponsor that submits it, all right? I have a quick question. Sure. Um, so do we go through this process even if we are uh, applying for exempt? Yes, so the exempt process initially is almost exactly the same. Mm -hmm. um, and then what you're doing though is you're justifying the work that you're doing as an exemption so the IRB can say, yes, we agree your work's exempt. Okay. okay. You still have to meet all the same regulatory and ethical requirements as non-exempt research. Mm -hmm. What we're doing is eliminating the regular ongoing review. So the annual or biannual renewals that you would have to do. Okay. Thanks. Yep. That's a great question though. Um, and then eventually we'll finish reviewing it and you'll get notification of approval and then you can start the work with human subjects. While the application's pending, you can't do any human subjects work yet. You have to wait until the full approval. You'll get consent forms back if you're doing documented consent with your project, they'll be stamped. The IRB wants you to use that stamped version. And um, let's see, what's my final one here? Uh, don't forget, there still might be other university requirements that you have to follow that aren't part of the IRB system. So make sure you're, you're aware of those and, and compliant with all the other university requirements. If you need to make changes, there's an amendment process. You report those to the IRB through the online CAP system. If it's a change to in, reduce immediate harm to subjects, you can implement that right away and then report it as an amendment to the IRB. But if you're just changing things because you want to improve the study, um, you have to go through the IRB process and get that change approved before implementing the change. All right. Um, it's all done again through the online CAP system. Continuing review. And I'm going to speed up. Sorry about that. But I, I do see we're going to run out of time here. The IRB approval will last one or two years. If it's convened review, it's up to one year. If it's expedited review, it's up to two years. So you have to submit a continuation if you're gonna go beyond that uh, ex expiration date. And that's called a continuing review application. Um, submit them early. We want you to submit those about 45 days before the expiration date, because what we don't want is the project's approval to expire before that renewal has been reviewed and reapproved. All right. Um, you go through the same online system and you also have to have your sponsor review the continuing review and submit it for you. You can also make changes at that time if you need to do amendments. All right, some quick, quick facts about our IRB reviews. Um, last calendar year, our IRB conducted 1,795 reviews. So those are exempt claims, amendments, closures, continuing reviews, everything. That's the total number of reviews we did at the Loyola IRB. Um, if you submit for convened review, expect it to take one to two months. Those are on a monthly, monthly meeting schedule. The schedule and deadlines for the meetings are on our website. Expedited review, you'll, you'll have a pre-review done. When you first submit it, someone from our staff takes a look at it and they look for anything that's incomplete or inconsistent. And we send that back to you if we catch something that needs to be fixed before it can go to the IRB. And that expedited IRB review process takes 10 to 15 business days. So expect to hear back in two to three weeks. Exempt reviews, they're, they're taking about two weeks or 10 business days. And amendments vary, they can be really quick. If it's something small, like we're just swapping out uh, personnel, those are usually done within a few days. But if it's something that needs a consultant or more extensive review, it can take longer. All right, I'm gonna turn things over to David to cover um, some common missteps that he'd like to talk about. Thanks, Andy. Um, so as a, uh, a member of the IRB, and I, and I do um, a significant number of the expedited reviews in the School of Education, um, 
these are just some common things that um, I've seen that are missteps that could actually slow you down, that if, if you think about them ahead of time, uh, you can take care of them. Uh, the first is really taking the time to really figure out what is your review level. If you submit an application that is um, really needs a full review and you're trying to put it in as expedited, it can get deferred and that means it will not be looked at until the next full review. So I have actually kicked up some of my reviews to full reviews because I, I see what the research is as being greater than minimal risk. So it's important to do that. The other thing is, is at the other end, much of the research, as Andy said, that we do could fall into particularly the new exempt categories. And it's better, I think, to get it done through exempt and then not have to worry about the work, uh, the, the um, IRB process oversight anymore if it meets that, that process. So take the time to do that. Uh, really determining, again, if your study is greater than minimal risk, taking the time. Um, and what does that mean? Uh, another thing is this just a misinterpretation of these terms, anonymous, de-identified, confidential, and identified data. You know, anonymous data is data that you do not know where it came from, you do not know who the individual is, and you have no way within that data of actually connecting it back to an individual, All right? De-identified data is, is that data that we may have an understanding of where it's come from and who it is, but we've taken out any of the markers that really would make that information uh, connected back to a person, all right? And then it's confidential. How are we maintaining the security of that data? Uh, so a lot of times we do a lot of qualitative research in, in the School of Education. How are you going to mask that data, particularly when it's being presented outwards? How are you going to secure that data even when you're storing it? So if you've done an in a, one of the things that we see is students will do interviews, audio record those, and then want to maintain those recordings throughout. Well, a voice is an identifiable piece of information that if I get access, if I'm not in your study and I get access to your audio recordings and I recognize a voice, that data has been breached in that regard. So you want to think about how do I quickly remove that out? So, you know, that's why we often ask that you transcribe and delete audio files, unless you have a good reason as to why you want to keep that. And then how will you keep that data secure and confidential? Uh, and then any identifiable data is any data that has information in it that allows me to connect that information to an individual. So thinking about how you're going to do that work. Uh, not really uh, fully explained participant activities uh, and data collection activities. Uh, the first two boxes in the summary section are asking two different things. Really pay attention to that. Because sometimes there may be activities, particularly in, in research done in schools, where part of the work that, the, that the, um, the participant is engaging in is required part of their experience in the school. It's not part of your research. The data that you might be collecting from their experience is part of your research. And so being able to distinguish between those two. Um, not describing or maybe overstating risks and benefits um, I think sometimes I'll, I'll see things like there's no risks. Well, at minimum, the risk is nothing beyond everyday experience, right? That's the, the, the minimal risk marking. Um, sometimes where it gets overstated is when you're thinking about what it is you're asking the participants to do, yes, some of the things that we might ask them to do could evoke a sense of emotion or stress. But if that's really not beyond what you would expect from an everyday experience, spending the time to detail that out makes me begin to wonder if what you're doing is a little bit above minimal risk. So think about that through. And then the same thing with benefits. Uh, we all want to believe that our research has great benefits, and it does often as we, as we hope it to be generalized out. But we're really talking about what are the direct benefits that the individual is going to be received, that participant will re be receiving from it. Um, and they're not big things, but sometimes I just ask people to clarify those. And it, again, it just slows it down some for you. Inconsistencies in applications. Something is said that you're going to do this activity in the summary, 
and then when I get to another part of it, you're doing something else. Uh, uh, you talk about collecting data through focus groups, and then later in informed consent, you talk about uh, interviews. And those are I see those as two very distinct data collection techniques. Uh, even though some people some people throw the thing focus group interviews, that always throws me because I see them as separate. Uh, being aware of that. One thing that always catches people in that risk category is if you are doing focus groups, you cannot guarantee confidentiality of what is said in a focus group. And that is an inherent risk of that process. Because where you may not share that information, you cannot guarantee that other members of that focus group will not share it outside. That's an inherent risk built into that methodology, that data collection process. That needs to be shared in the risk section and it needs to be part of your informed consent process. Uh, usually the language that I use is, you know, the, the researcher cannot guarantee confidentiality of what is said in focus groups that it would not be shared by other members of the focus group outside of the focus group. However, the researcher encourages all participants not to share information. And so I just put it like that. Um, not fully explaining your recruitment processes or informed consent processes. Be detailed, be explicit about things. You know, if you're going to contact somebody to get a list of emails, tell us who that person is, how you're gonna contact them. What's the email you'll send to them and put that in the attachments. Um, same thing in your informed consent process. What are the actual steps you're gonna to take to consent your participants? I believe that a lot of times in educational research, we underuse the waiver of documented consent. Um, there is research that we do that's online data collection through online surveys. We sometimes are using Zoom or phone interviews. All of these could meet the option to for a waiver of documented consent. Uh, I just really encourage you to take a look at those options if it falls into it. Uh, I, I recommend it because it just makes your process of your research a little easier. It doesn't mean you, can't, you don't have to consent people. You still have to have a consent process, but you don't have to collect signed documents. And I've, I've had uh, you know, reviews come through where people are going through these you know, hoops to get people to prove that they signed the document in front of them on Zoom when recording an interview through Zoom could meet waiver of documented consent, all right? Um, um, excuse me, really yeah. quickly on that. Um, is there like similar to the guide on how to determine if you can go ahead and apply for exemption, is there a guide of some kind that would illuminate like how we can um, utilize a waiver of documented consent, like what you said about Zoom makes sense because there's a pop-up you can enable in Zoom that says you're being recorded and then the person would consent to that. But are there other kind of shortcuts or ways to understand the best way to collect that consent? Well, th there's a lot of different ways within that consenting process, Sydney. So one, one way is to obtain verbal consent, that, that you provide your consent form to your participant Mm -hmm. consent and talk through it, mm -hmm. the, the script as if they were to sign it, and then you mm -hmm. ask them to verbally consent. That verbal consent could be recorded if you're recording. You could also just document, mm -hmm. on this day, this participant verbally consented. And that would fly with you all and for the most part. Yes, because when you really get down to that, if, if I said no to you, you would have no data from me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but documenting that process is the important thing. Most people who are doing audio recording should just ask the person if after they've read it and they said yes, say, okay, well, I'm gonna start the recording and I'm gonna ask you if you consent, if you're consenting to this research. Thank and, you. Let you. Thank and there's a lot of flow charts that, that um, Andy just put in there that show how to do some of that work and how to make that decision. Um, not attaching documents. Um, you reference that you're going to do a recruitment email and then there's no recruitment email in the attachment. We have to review those things to look at there's consistency in what's happening in the recruitment emails and what's being said in the application. So um, make sure that they're there. Um, 
you don't necessarily, I, I, I reference mine when I'm filling out an application. I'll say, you know, re, uh, re, recruitment email, teacher participants, see attachments. You don't have to do that. Just make sure that they're in their attachments. Uh, we will go through and look at them. Um, information in the application doesn't match information in attachments. Uh, what you say is the risk in the application isn't stated in the informed consent. The procedures that you talk about doing in the application aren't the procedures present in the um, informed consent process. They need to be really aligned. Uh, they have to be aligned. Uh, because what we're what we're saying is we're approving this set of research activities, and that's what the, your participant is agreeing to consent to do. Um, a, one we've had a problem with in the School of Education, and why I bring it up, um, is that we've had students who, in their initial review, are given a conditional approval, which means that they need to address some things in their application and they see conditional approval as they can move forward in recruiting and data collection. You cannot. You cannot move forward until you actually have the approved, um, an approval letter and your consent form is stamped with approval from our IRB because you must use that, that <coughs> consent form. Any questions? We could go to the next one. So there are a lot of useful resources out there. Um, really, the, the Loyola R, uh, ORS, Officer Research Services, and the IRB websites are great. There's a lot of things they'll, they'll talk you through explaining. There are templates that you can follow for things that you're doing, like, it, like an informed consent document. Um, we really recommend that you use those templates, particularly for your informed consent documents. Because one, they're ones that we or the IRB has put together that if you're using it, it's going to make the process a lot easier because all the information that should be in an informed consent is in that template. You just need to put in the particulars for your study. Um, one thing that people often leave off on their informed consent, which I think sometimes is kind of funny, is their contact information about themselves. Uh, they, they don't identify themselves as the researcher. Be proud of it. You're doing the research, put your name on it. Um, the Office of Human Research Protections from uh, Health and Human Services. Again, lots of good information there. Free tutorials, videos, they're the, the decision charts that are excellent. Uh, I go look at them. Sometimes when I'm looking at reviews, I'll go to their website, pull up a decision chart to, uh, to refresh myself when I'm doing a review. So use those. There's even some great FAQs on it as well. Um, Use uh, your IRB committee members that are in the School of Education. All right. That is Dr. Leanne Kellemine, although she's on break right now. So Doc, Dr. Tora Chang is filling in for her. Uh, but starting next year, uh, Leanne's coming back from my understanding. Um, Dr. Eileen Ettinger is another member of the IRB committee. And then myself, we are faculty in the School of Education that sit on the committee. It is acceptable to have conversations with us before you fill out an application, while you're filling out an application. Um, this isn't to be a hidden thing, you know, um, it, it's to be a, a learning experience is what I think about it as when my, when my own doctoral students go through it. Um, so use us. Uh, I, I, I just got a question from a student who I did the review and he didn't understand one of my comments so he contacted me, I opened up the application again, I looked through it and said, oh, okay, this is what I'm trying to, to say. And I re-explained it and I, he hasn't responded back. So I assume my second explanation made sense. Uh, and so he's able to move forward then. And then uh, the next thing, um, I kind of put together some 10 tips or recommendations for the dissertation IRB process. Um, and they're kind of related to these missteps in a, re, in a way. Before starting, determine what type of review is appropriate. You need to know that information before you begin the process because you're going to have to pick one. All right? It's okay if you pick the wrong one. If you pick exempt and it comes through 
and uh, the reviewer says, no, this doesn't fit exempt, you're going to get information back. But because we expect you to fill out a lot of the information related to the research, that doesn't get lost. We're able to kick it over to expedite it, and then you can change some things. Um, check if other, IRB, other IRBs need to approve your research. We do research in public schools. So if you're in Chicago public schools, RRB will require a review of your work. But you need to ask every school in every district if you're doing work in there or any other organization. If you're going to be doing research at another university as a part of your work as a higher ed student, collecting data from students at another university, you need to check to see if you need to go through their, their IRB approval process all right? or what they require. Uh, letters of cooperation. Uh, oftentimes, we're working with agencies or schools. We don't necessarily need to have an IRB approval, but it's good to get a letter of cooperation saying that somebody there who has an authoritative role or authority role can say, yes, we, we know they're coming in and we're, we're okay with them coming in. Sometimes you, don't get, you won't be able to get those letters because you're going to identify which organizations you're going to work with after you got approval from us. That's okay. That's why we have the amendment process. Every time you get an approval letter, amend your application, submit it to the attachments. Uh, like Annie said, that's one of those real quick amendment things. All right. Um, ask IRB committee members if you have questions. Also do it with your comments. If you, if you get comments back and you're not sure, reach out and ask before you address it. Um, Read carefully the requirements of each box in the application before completing the application. Um, if you take the time to go through and see exactly what's being asked in each section and what specifically is being asked in each box, you can then create, I think, an outline. I often still do this. I'll go through and say, summary, I need to make sure this is in here, this is in here, this is in here. All right. Um, I prefer preparing my attachments before I start doing the application for two reasons. One, I've got the outline of what I need and what's going to be a part of. Uh, like if I, I know my consenting process is going to involve an email to principals and then an email to the, the teachers that I got the list of email addresses from that principal to contact. I know I need two emails. I need to write those two emails and they need to fit with what I need to be doing in my procedure section, my data collection work. And so I just write those. Um, and then I know they're there. So when I've got to attach them, I don't forget to attach, or I know I need to attach them. Um, and again, use those templates. Be explicit in your responses. Um, sometimes I'm sending things back because while I'm reading it, what will come across my mind is, oh, it sounds like they're doing this, but I can't make a judgment based on I think it could be this. I have to make a judgment on this is what you're doing. All right. So I can't interject in what I think is going to happen. I can only re I can only evaluate the, the application on what is said. So be explicit. And it is OK to be redundant. Yes, there will be some things you say again and again. That's fine. It's OK. It, uh, it's uh, unlike you know writing a manuscript where you don't want to be saying the same thing exactly the same way over and over again. That's okay in an IRB application, I think. A big one, review the application with your chair before submitting it. I think some of the things that um, get kicked back to students could be things that their chair might have been able to caught before. And so having a, a sit down, so normally what I do through the process is we have a conversation, my student and I have a conversation about IRB once they've got their proposal defended and they're able to apply. Um, if they've got questions about the application itself, we go through that, but then they finish it. And when they're done, we meet and we talk about all the parts of it, or they send it to me and say, hey, will you look at it? And then can we meet, all right? And so we'll then talk and there are some things I might say, hey, fix this. Sometimes I look through it and I just send them an email and say, it looks really great. This section, however, you need to add these things. That does two things. One, it allows me to know that they're at the point that pretty soon I'm going to be getting an email to hit submit. All right. 
Um, and so it's on my radar, but it also helps probably prevent maybe some, some kickback on things that could have been resolved beforehand. Um, the last thing then is submit amendments for approval applications uh, for an approved application or study when needed. If you're unsure if you need to have a, an amendment, ask. You're better off doing an amendment and it not being necessary than not doing an amendment and violating ethics. Better, th this is one of those things where you can't really beg forgiveness if you do it wrong. Um, it's better to get permission ahead in this case, even if you don't really need that permission, all right? But most of the things that you change will. So if you're changing a couple of the questions on your questionnaire, yeah, you, you need to let us see those uh, and let us approve it. Again, th those are, that's a simple thing. Um, sometimes your recruiting processes aren't working as well as you want. You're not getting you know, the, the size of the sample that you're looking for. So you're gonna try something different. You need to, to take that uh, through the IRB and amend it. Any questions for me? I do. Um, thank you so much for this overview. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is, at what point in your doctoral process do you start this process? Because many of us right now are either working on a prospectus or starting to do our qualifying exams. When, when does this part kick in? <laughs> Uh, well, for me, with my students, and it may be different with different chairs, I don't ask my students to begin to do their IRB proposal work, filling out the application, until they're done with their reader's copy that we've sent to their committee for their proposal defense. I then say to them, let's talk about the IRB, go take a look at it, let's start, you know, you could even start an application but realize they, I cannot submit that application, even if it's perfect, until what they provided is that they've gone through the defense and we've signed the document that, I, that they have to give IRB to show to IRB that their proposal has been uh, accepted. Okay. But I get them going on it for a couple of reasons. Uh, then is things may change in the proposal defense. That happens sometimes. It could affect then what has to be in the IRB, but you just go in and fix it versus starting from the scratch, right? Mm -hmm. Not only that, there's that two week period or three week period, maybe month period between when you give the readers the copy of your proposal and you have that actual oral proposal defense where you're just waiting. So to keep the process moving, I like to get them to do it. That's when I have them start it usually. Okay. And then my second question is, during this process, you've alluded to it a little bit, but I just wanted to clarify, do you have to know your subjects in advance? And then if the subject happens to become somebody different, is that when you do the amendment? Or are you okay submitting a proposal saying, this is the scope of the participant that I would like to achieve? Um, the reason I'm asking this is because I know somebody who just went through this process at a different university and when her subject changed to a different person, she had to keep amending it, her um, IRB proposal. So I just wanted to get a little clarification on that. Well, I, I think uh, I'm, when you're saying that you should be able to, when you start it, do an application, identify the population and the characteristics of that population that you are sampling from. Okay. Okay. You should be. If the characteristics of that population change and you're, you're going to either expand that population particularly or go after a different set of characteristics, like maybe age different, then you do need to amend okay. because there may be implications. So let's say that you're, you're, um, you're doing a research study where you're looking at um, Originally, your population is Latinx college students, but you've never identified them, say, as undocumented students, all right? And then all of a sudden you say, well, I'm going to start trying to interview undocumented students. 
that becomes a new population. We have to think a little differently, uh, you know, particularly historically in some of the political times that we were in over the last four years. The IRB was being very concerned about research and thinking through what were the risks, because the risk wasn't just necessarily the questions you were asking in terms of your data collection, but the fact that you're now identifying people through your study as being undocumented, which places them in a risk, a different risk. Category. So you have to be aware of those things. So yeah, like I said, better to amend and not have to have amended than not to amend and get in trouble. Anything else? Well, thanks for your time, everyone. Um, my contact information is on the screen now. Feel free to give me a call, an email, anytime. Whatever we can do to help or answer questions, we're happy to, to be here. And th thank you for inviting me. Um, like I said, you, use the faculty who are on the IRB as resources. Uh, that, that's part of our service responsibility.